Hi guys, good day. I am Elon Bobert. Axie.com online personal for teaching zoology. So in the last class we have just started the digest system. The various components of digestive system. And also the various events of physiology of digestion. And which also we have completed something about the absorption process. So what do you mean by absorption? So what are the materials which are being absorbed? What way they are being absorbed in different parts of the digestive tract, either in the form of active transport or in the form of passive transport or by means of facilitated transport. Now, so as we have already just mentioned about, the process of absorption happens to occur mainly in the small industry, that to the alien region, particularly through the villi region, where you have single layer of epithelial cells. But the process of absorption occurs in different parts of the digestive system, though the principal organ of absorption, the alien or the industry. So we have the absorption process occurs in different parts of the digestive tract, either in the mouth or in the stomach or in the small industry or in the large industry. But we have no process of absorption either in the just to the esophagus. There is no digestion, there is no absorption, the esophagus. And also in the cecum region of the industry. Now, we have the following general column which shows the various processes of absorption in different parts of the digestive tract. So what are the different places of absorption? And what are the materials which are being absorbed in these places? Let's have the table column a summary of uh, the various sites of absorption and uh, the various materials what are absorbed in these areas. So if you are taking the mouth region, we have small amount of the just actually the drugs absorb. Only small uh, negligible concentration of drugs may absorb in the mouth cavity and in the stomach, though it is a place of digestion of carbohydrates. We have a small amount of water absorption, a small amount of simple sugar absorption and some of the alcohol is also being absorbed in this region. So the stomach is not the major part of absorption, some of materials are absorbed. And we have the small industry, what I said earlier, it is nothing but actually the principal organ of absorption, the alien region particularly, where you have numerous villi and which is the ultimate unit of absorption. So almost all the materials, the breakdown products of carbohydrates, proteins, fats, vitamins, water and minerals all be absorbed mostly in this area. So the ultimate products, the final products of carbohydrates like glucose, then the amino acids, the products of protein, then we have the fatty acids and glycerol, the products of fats, all being absorbed mainly through the intestinal mucosa. And here also, we have the transport of materials occur either by means of active transport or by means of passive transport or by means of facilitated transport, what I described in the last class. Now, what is the role of large industry? So it is a place where maximum absorption of water takes place. Maximum absorption of water takes place. The undigested waste products become solidified because of the reabsorption of water. And also it is a place of absorption of some of the minerals, for example sodium, we have calcium. Some products of these minerals also being absorbed in these areas along with the drugs. But I mentioned already the principal area of destruction of drugs or alcohol it is nothing but the liver one. Liver is the factory of the body where we have the breakdown of drugs and also the antibiotics and also the alcohol all being completely degraded. And the absorption of these materials once they are escaping, being absorbed here in these areas, again transported to the liver, where once again they are being broken if they are not completely broken. So these are all the different areas of absorption, the different materials which are absorbed, the ultimate products of digestion. Now after the absorption process, we have the next event, what is called assimilation. We can actually say, the whole saying, we are what we eat, we are what we eat. So whatever food materials we are eating are being converted into the body substance and that phenomenon is called assimilation process. 
Simply we can say the conversion of food into body substance. Conversion of food into body substance that is called assimilation. That's why I use the term, I use the phrase, we are what we eat. Now, what is assimilation? So, from the lumen of the intestine, the food particles are absorbed. First, they are transported to the liver by means of hepatic portal vein. Hepatic portal vein is responsible for the transport of almost all the materials except in the fatty acids and it is not, they return to it later only. And now, the hepatic portal vein starting from the digestive tract normally carries all the absorbed food materials to the liver and from where they are transported to different parts of the body through heart. So where what will happen? In the cells, the absorbed and transported food materials are converted into cellular organization. We can say either the protoplasm or the different organelles. That process actually conversion of food into cellular organization. The main one, the protoplasm. And also, some food materials are utilized for release of energy for utilization. So this process of conversion of food materials into cellular organization and energy for utilization is called assimilation process. So that is what is happening. So assimilation is somehow we can say an uh, anabolic process. Anabolic process because synthetic events are taking place in the cytoplasm, the formation of the protoplasm, the different materials, organelles, all they happen to occur because of the assimilation process. Now, after the absorption process, in the digestive tract, we have certain materials are being left. They are considered as the undigested base materials and they, are, they should be eliminated. That process of removal of these waste materials, what we call as feces, is called defecation or digestion. So defecation is nothing but the ingestion of fecal matter from the digestive tract through the anal opening. So it is a voluntary process, it is actually a voluntary process, it is a voluntary process, not an involuntary process, it is a voluntary process and it depends on the neural reflex and it is carried out by because of uh, we can say the more massive peristaltic movement. So normally the intestine is moving, exhibiting peristaltic wave just like the esophagus for conveying the food towards the stomach. Here too we have, through the intestine, we have peristaltic waves. And such peristaltic waves occurring actually massively in the digestive tract, particularly in the rectum, for bowel movement, what we can say, the defecation process. So normally the peristaltic movement in the rectum or in the large intestine is being exhibited by one hormone, what is called serotonin, secreted by the crypts of liver cool the intestinal glands. One type of cells what they mentioned, argentafin cells. The argentafin cells are responsible for secreting the serotonin. The serotonin is also acting as a neurotransmitter. It is also acting as a chemical alarm signals, taking part in inflammatory responses, just like uh, just like histamine. We will be studying more later in the immunology. So serotonin is the most important substance, responsible for conducting the impulses at the synapse. Also responsible for the peristaltic movement, massive peristaltic movement in the large intestine for propelling the base towards outside. So anyway, the defecation is nothing but a voluntary process, a neural reflex. Once the rectum is filled with the filled with the base products, one can desire to just eliminate it voluntarily under the control of the nervous system, along with some hormonal effect, what is called serotonin, a chemical substance. Now, so we are coming to the ultimate part of the digestive system, the last part. So what are the disorders related to the digestive tract? So we have a number of disorders related to the digestive tract because of uh, protozoan infections or bacterial infections or because of viral infections. A number of parasitic forms also form in the form of round wounds or tape wounds etc. So anyway the inflammation and the infections of the digestive tract is caused by bacterial infections, viral infections and also by different types of helminthic parasites which are living as endoparasites. We have the tapeworm tinea solium, the roundworm ascaris glomericoides, then the threadworm trichinella, the hookworm ancelistoma duodenale, the pinworm just enterobius vermicularis and also other things. For example, the important protozoan we have in the form of giardia intestinalis 
the first parasitic protozoan that was actually came to know that. So it is also actually the old men of stomach. It is called as the old men of stomach and the old men of intestine existing actually as it was discovered first. It is considered as like that. The old man of the intestine or the old man of the stomach, the one which causes intestinal diarrhea. In the case of children, you know that one the root of virus, the one responsible for causing diarrhea. So, shigarli, a type of bacterial diarrhea, and shigarli or shigarlosis caused by shigarli bacterium, the one which causes diarrhea. So, these are some of the infections in general. I am using that one, I am saying that one. So, we have a number of disorders just affecting the digestive tract, particularly the water and food bone diseases. Those diseases which are transmitted through contaminated food and water affect the digestive tract in a large scale. Now, so all of you are given as per your syllabus, the main syllabus, the first one, jaundice. You know that part, it is related to the liver. The liver is affected, leading to the jaundice condition because of two effects. One is what is called the liver cirrhosis, another one, hepatitis. So, what is liver cirrhosis? The glandular cells of the liver has been modified as fibrous tissues so that the liver loses its ability to secrete the bile. What is the reason for liver cirrhosis? It is also called fatty liver syndrome. Fatty liver syndrome. So it is very common in the case of drug out persons, a person who is consuming alcohol for a long period. In such cases what will happen? The glandular cells of the epithelium of liver or the hepatocytes have been modified and have been replaced into fibrous tissues so that the liver loses its function that is called liver cirrhosis or also called fatty liver syndrome the main reason because of alcoholic consumption then hepatitis so it is caused by a variety of factors so we have for example it is maybe it may be because of uh, it may be because of infections or it may be because of uh, some inflammation of the liver so, hepatitis B virus, the most common virus, the most dangerous virus, then even AIDS virus, that one causes liver carcinoma and jaundice. So, hepatitis, the inflammation of uh, the liver, that is also one of the factors responsible for causing jaundice. So, what would happen? So, the liver enabled to produce or produces pigments in abnormal way. In the body, you know that one, we have the pigments. The bilirubin and bilirubin, the two pigments responsible for the coloration of the bile. So when the bilirubin breakdown is abnormal, it is being excreted more and more, it is being liberated more and more, so that it gets settled down in the body, in the cells and also in the eye region, giving yellow hue or yellow color to the body and that is one of the symptoms of jaundice. It is also being excreted along with the urine. So the urine also turns yellow. It is being retained for a long while. So skin and eyes turns yellow, one of the symptoms. This is because of the deposits of bile pigments, particularly one pigment bilirubin. The pigment which is being degraded because of uh, the hemoglobin breakdown. Now the second is our vomiting. This is a common symptom you know that part. It is nothing but regurgitation process. So, regurgitation is very common in the case of young children, you know, that are the new, newborn infants. The reason for that one, at the junction of the esophagus and the stomach, we have gastro, gastroesophageal sphincter. And that is the one which normally regulates the flow of food from esophagus to the stomach. But in the case of infants, that sphincter is not well developed. It is a delicate in nature. That is why the child, the newborn child is vomiting very often. That is very common in the case of newborn child. That is because of uh, that is a sphincter which is not well developed. But in the case of adult, it is because of some irritation in the stomach. So it is nothing but the ejection of the stomach contents through the esophagus. There are so many reasons for this vomiting. Because of the irritation in the stomach or because of the food poison, because of the presence of some irritable materials in the stomach. You know the process of peristalsis, what I described in the beginning. The process of actually propelling the food materials from the buccal cavity towards the esophagus by means of successive wave of contractions is called what we can say the peristalsis. Sometimes we have the reverse peristalsis or we can say anti-peristalsis. 
Diagonal peristalsis is also called anastalsis. Anastalsis. This is always called anti-peristalsis. Anastalsis. It is also one of the causes for acting the vomiting process. But in general, vomiting is a reflex act. If there is any irritation either in the buccal cavity or in the esophagus or even the stomach, that results in the regurgitation of food materials taking place voluntarily, not voluntarily but involuntarily. It takes place by means of involuntary process. That is why most of the involuntary process, you know that one controlled by middle oblongator. The center for vomiting is also located in the middle of the So the center for vomiting is also located in the middle of the as it's a reflex activity controlled by the middle of the brain. So before vomiting, we have a kind of sickness, a feeling of sickness with an urge to vomit and that is called nausea. A feeling of sickness with an urge to vomit but there is no vomiting. So normally a feeling of nausea precedes before vomiting. So, that is about the vomiting process, the common event. This is because of some irritation or food poison, anything we can see. Now, diarrhea. So, we have a rice water stool. That is, the frequency of bowel movement is more. The frequency of bowel movement is more. So, we have the frequency of more and more bowel movement with the increased liquidity of what is called the fecal mat. So, the fecal matter is centered along with more loss of water. That is why you use the word increased liquidity of fecal matter or discharge. This is because of various infections, either by means of bacteria or by means of virus. For example, rotavirus in the case of children causes diarrhea. Bacteria, I mentioned, shigalli causes shigallosis, a kind of what is called bacterial diarrhea. Then protozoan infection, giardia a kind of protozoan, a flagellate protozoan responsible for causing diarrhea. So diarrhea may be because of bacterial infection or viral infection or protozoan infections. So increased frequency of bowel movement and also increased liquidity of fecal discharge. And as a result the person is unable to take more and more food. So this condition reduces the absorption of food also because it affects the mucal layer mucosal layer or mucal layer of the digestive tract and also the absorptive unit namely village. Now constipation. It is opposite to that of diarrhea. Here there is no frequent bowel movement. The fecal material is not discharged. It is being retained in the rectum. That is why we have irregular bowel movement. So that is called constipation. This is also because of not taking what we have that is roughage. So one has to use more roughage food, a fibrous food for easy elimination of waste materials. Otherwise we would have the process, the constipation, the disease. It's very common also in the case of cattle. Now indigestion. So because of having inadequate enzyme, or because of taking spicy food, or because of tension, or because of some other reasons, for example overeating the food, or because of food poison. So these are all some of the reasons which make up the digestive tract not to digest the food properly. So that process is called indigestion. That is why the person is always having the feeling of fullness of the stomach. So he is not feeling the empty stomach, he is always having the fullness of the stomach, the feeling is there. But he just actually accustomed not to take much food. So the food is not properly digested in the case of indigestion. I have given the reasons also because of the inadequate enzyme secretion, anxiety or the tension or stress, even the food poisoning, overeating and also the spicy food is also one of the reasons for indigestion. So in addition to these disorders, we also have some other disorders. You know that one, the dental caries associated with the digestive system. Then we have the peptic ulcer also related to the digestive system, the duodenal ulcer, appendicitis, the inflammation of the appendix related to the digestive tract. Then we have the gallstone formation, the formation of stones because of the alteration, the composition of the bite. So these are all some of the disorders what we have related to the digestive tract. So but one if you are given here, we will talk about more later. Then, some of the disorders because of a protein deficiency, then calorie deficiency, 
and that disorders normally occur in the case of infants or children the newborn children less than one year of age or in the case of children above one year of age and all together all these disorders together called protein energy malnutrition protein energy malnutrition this is because of the deficiency of two factors so factor number one low protein diet factor number two low calorie food the energy value of food what the child is being given is deficient of calorie so these are all the two factors are primarily or mainly responsible for causing this protein energy malnutrition simply we can say PEM so deficiency of what is called the protein and the deficiency of total food calories the energy now it is very common particularly in the case of our underdeveloped countries for example South and Southeast Asia even in the case of African countries Central Africa West Africa, even in the case of South America also we have this disorder. So, one can say mostly it is very common in the case of underdeveloped countries. So, there are two disorders because of this PEM or protein energy malnutrition. One is called marasmus, another one is called washia. So, these are the two disorders particularly affecting the children almost in all the countries of underdeveloped areas. So, the wealthier countries can tolerate the developing countries have some sort of such disorders in the case of infants. Okay, so the, even they are causing the death of the individual, take out the lives of children or infants. So one is marasmus, another one kosher. Now let us let us look into the first one, marasmus. What is the reason for that? So I mentioned there are two factors responsible for the development of such disorders. One is deficiency of proteins, another one deficiency of calorie. Now, marasmus is normally caused by the simultaneous deficiency of both proteins and then the calories. A food which contains low calorie, a food which contains low proteins. These are the two major criteria, the factors responsible for the development of marasmus. Again, it is very common in the case of children or infants less than one year of age. The second one, what we have caused here, cut above one year of age, and this one is less than one year of age. So what is the reason for that one? So the main reason is the mother is not feeding the young one. If the mother's food or what is called the mother's milk we can say, the mother's milk is replaced by a food or a diet, the one which contains low calorie value, the one which contains low protein. So this is very common normally the mother has normally having the second pregnancy or the second child while she is not looking into the child which is already there, the first child, the old child. So, too early pregnancy after the first one or too early childbirth after the first one may not actually make the mother to concentrate on the second child. So, the first child, the older child, we can say, not the second, the first child or the older child. So, is he or she is not being provided, that is the proper diet containing proteins and then the calorie. Now, what are the symptoms? So, whenever we have the protein deficiency, it directly affects mainly the growth. So, protein deficiency always in vascular and also there is no development of proteins in the tissues. This is number one. And number two, extreme emaciation. The meaning for emaciation, thinning of the body. Body becomes very thin. So, the muscle is being wasted. There is no normal development of the muscles. Once there is no protein, there is no formation of muscles. The body is simply covered with a fold of skin that's so with bones on elevated, exposed easily. So extreme emaciation, the body becomes very thin and also the limbs become very thin. Then above the skin, the skin is always dry, very thin and wrinkled. Then, then the, as the growth rate has been declined, what will happen the body weight also just lost. Decrease in body weight considerably because of the loss of growth rate. So, whenever the growth rate is affected, the growth rate not only affects the physical structure but also the mental development. So, it also affects the growth and the development of brain as well as also we have the mental functions affected. So, the child is somewhat mentally retarded. So, these are some of the symptoms related to. We can see in the picture about the nature of the symptoms of a child just taken up from Africa. The Central Africa. See the child, the body is actually very thin. Emaciation, thinning of the limbs. The muscles, this is that one last. The muscles absent below the skin. 
That's why you could see the bones were easy. That's the nature of the marasmus species. Now the next one, kosher. So it was also noticed more and more in Somalian countries and also in African countries. That is why the word is coming from Africa. That is a word from Ghana. The meaning rejected chan. The meaning for the kosher rejected chan. That is why it is given the name kosher for the disease. As the child is being rejected, not being given properly the protein rich food. So the child develops a disorder. That is why the name is given kosher. So it is produced only by protein deficiency, not by calorie deficiency. The previous one is caused because of the protein deficiency. Now this is an accompanied by what is called the calorie deficiency. There is no calorie deficiency, only the protein deficiency is responsible for the development of the disorder. Once again, it is normally results from the replacement of mother's milk as in the case of that one. Replacement of the mother's milk with the diet or food. The one which contains high calorie but low protein. There you have the diet contains both low calorie and low protein. But here the food or the diet contains high calorie. The energy value is there but the low protein diet. That is one of the reasons for the development of a the disease. In the case of infants more than one year of age. And that one less than one year of age and this one more than one year of age. So here also we have the wasting of muscles as in the case of marasmus. Wasting the muscles, the muscles have been lost, so that is why the body becomes very thin. The skin is directly connected to the bones. The child looking very thin, showing emaciation. Then thinning of the limbs, as in the case of Erasmus. And also here, as the failure of growth and mental development, the child is mentally retarded. Then what are the other symptoms other than Erasmus? How can you differentiate this one? So the symptoms other than Erasmus. Extensive edema, accumulation of fluid, particularly in the facial region, in the hand and feet, edematic condition. The word edema refers to accumulation of fluid, the interstellar fluid. So the interstitial fluid we have, that is why the bulging or the bloated part of the body, bloating. You see, particularly in the facial region, in the hand and feet, accumulation of fluid, that is called edema. That leads to the swelling of body parts. And you cannot see the swelling of body parts in the case of marasmus. Then, under the symptom, you could see in the picture, the belly region appear enlarged. Though they are very thin, accumulation of fluid in the particular region, for example, face, hand and feet. You see that one, the belly region appear enlarged, unlike marasmus. You cannot see this condition there. That is the main difference between these two. There you have, before one year of age, here, after one year of age. You cannot see any enigmatic condition. You cannot see any belly region appear enlarged there in the case of marasmus. So these are all the two disorders caused because of the two factors. One is protein deficiency, another one calorie value deficiency. Now while we are just actually calculating the energy value of food and also the energy requirement of animals, we are using certain units. So the energy requirement of animals or the energy content of the food can be actually expressed by using the unit what is called the calorie. How much amount of energy needed by an animal body that is called also calorie and how much amount of energy normally released or found in each food items like carbohydrates, proteins and fats. So the unit used for expressing the energy found in animal body or the energy requirements in the form of calorie or joule. Then what do you mean by calorie? So it is nothing but the amount of heat required. To raise the temperature of 1 gram of water by 1 degree Celsius. Suppose we are taking 1 gram of food or 1 gram of just here we are taking 1 gram of water and the temperature of water now is 20 degree Celsius. We are raising the temperature of that 1 gram of water with the 20 degree Celsius to 21 degree Celsius. So the amount of heat required for converting that 1 gram of water to the 20 degree Celsius to 21 degree Celsius is called what is known as 1 calorie. It's also called small calorie. So the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of 1 gram of water to 1 degree Celsius. That is called calorie. So we can also calculate the kilocalorie or kilojoules. Or we can use the word for example capital C for calorie. This is what is known as a big calorie or capital G. That refers to 1 kilocalorie or 1 kilojoule. And what is the definition for this one? So it is the amount of heat record to raise the temperature of 1 kilogram of water to 1 degree Celsius. That is called a big calorie 
or kilocalorie or kilojoules. The amount of heat required to raise the temperature of 1 kilogram of water to 1 degree Celsius. So these are all the units what we are using actually to calculate the energy value of different types of substances, for example the carbohydrates, proteins and fats. Then, so for calculating the energy value we have two terms. We are calculating actually energy values by means of two terms. One, we can calculate either the grass calorific or grass energy value or the physiologic value. So what do you mean by grass calorific value? or gross energy value. So when we are taking one gram of food and place it inside what is called a bomb calorimeter. The bomb calorimeter is normally used to just to cause the combustion of food to release the energy. It is nothing but actually a closed metal chamber filled with oxygen for combustion. So the amount of heat liberated when one gram of carbohydrate, one one gram of food, any food is completely combusted in a bomb colorimeter is called what is known as gross energy value. This is in experimental analysis. We are doing it outside the body in vitro in a metal chain. So that is what is called the gross colorific value or gross energy value. The amount of heat liberated from a complete combustion of one gram of food in a bomb colorimeter outside the body in an experimental setting. And that is called gross energy value. Now in contrast to this one, we have another value what is called physiologic value. The physiologic value is always different from the gross calorie value or gross what is called energy value. So even when you are taking for example, the capacity of stomach, there is total capacity and vital capacity. Similarly, if you are taking the lungs, we have total capacity and vital capacity. So the vital capacity is a working capacity. The total capacity is not a working capacity. Take an example of a, a stomach or take an example of a grinder, the capacity 1.5 litre. So if you are putting 1.5 litre of rice in a grinder, it cannot have the ability of actually grinding, though its capacity, the total capacity is 1.5 litres. But its working capacity, the vital capacity, you can get it only while freezing, just only 1 or 1 kilogram or simply that is 500 grams of rice. So that is what is called the working capacity. Likewise also the human body, the lung capacity, the total capacity and vital capacity. Also for the stomach, we have the total capacity and vital capacity. And likewise here, so here this is the amount of heat liberated when actually one gram of food is burned or oxidized or it is being combusted in a metallic chamber. But the physiologic value refers to, here the definition what I given simply different. So the actual amount of energy combustion of the meaning I will tell you, the actual amount of energy combustion of 1 gram of food is its physiologic value. The actual amount of energy combustion of 1 gram of food. What is the meaning for that one? Whenever we are using the word physiology, it always refers to a living body. So, the amount of energy liberated when 1 gram of food is normally combusted in the human body. This is called physiological. The actual amount of energy liberated when one gram of food is normally combusted or undergoing combustion process in the human body or in the living body is called physiologic value and that is always higher, the one which is normally done outside. But when we are coming to the working capacity, the physiologic value is always different from what is called the gross energy value. Now I will show the comparison. So this is nothing but the actual amount of energy liberated in the human body when one gram of food is combusted. That is what is called physiologic value. So that is why here it is given the actual amount of energy combustion of one gram of food. Actual amount of energy combustion of one gram of food in the living cell. You have to add this statement also in the living cells. Now we will compare the gross energy value or gross calorific value for the three different types of substances and the physiologic value. Now if you are taking carbohydrates, where it is being combusted outside the body, we can have 4.1 kilocalories per gram. The same one in our body, we can have only 4 kilocalories. Again for proteins. So in the metallic actually chamber, we have received 5.65 kilocalories per gram of proteins. There it is only 4. This is the actual value liberated inside the body of us. Then similarly for the fats. So the amount of energy available in fat is always higher than that of carbohydrates. We can say also twice as much energy as that of carbohydrates. 
Now here also the cross color effect value become 9.45 kilocalories per gram but in the original status in the living body it is only 9 kilocalories of energy being released per gram of fats inside the body. So these are some of the comparisons you have to know what do you mean by actual cross calorific value and what do you mean by physiologic value. So it is nothing but the actual amount of energy released in the human body when one gram of carbohydrate or proteins or fats are oxidized. So with this just I concluded the various events of digest system. So you can have you can have the right to ask any questions later or post the questions. Now I'd like to pass on to the next part that is what we have the metabolism.